Hello, salam, shalom, namaste, sashikal, aloha, hola, ciao, bonjour, buna, mabuhai, and jean dobre. It's so good to be with you again. And you know, I know you'll be so glad you have joined us today because we have a wonderful guest with us. It's Sarah Birchmeyer, who is a manifestation energy and trauma practitioner and actually also a best-selling author welcome sarah i'm so excited and happy to have you with us thank you for having me i'm so excited to be here yes and sarah please tell us more about who you are and what you do well i am a trauma practitioner um i help women heal from deep traumas in the body so that they can clear out those limited story that they've been believing for years, lifetimes, (laughs) whatever the case, and really come to know the truth of who they are as spiritual beings so that they can manifest the desires that are deep-seated in their heart. Oh, I love that. I love that. (sighs) yes oh gosh you know trauma in our lives I mean we all experience it whether it's little traumas or big trauma or traumas Uh, gosh but we have all experienced trauma in our lives and I think a lot of times people don't even uh, realize that what they've experienced has impacted them like a trauma. And uh, a lot of us also have never had any kind of education or systematic learning about how to help ourselves heal from trauma or even, yeah, I mean, we can't recognize that when we are feeling are experiencing trauma ourselves we can't always recognize it when we are seeing it in other people and we don't know how to help ourselves or other people out of it so it's oh my gosh it can really um, be challenging in that way um what's i mean oh my gosh what uh, like what would you say are some of the key um clues that someone can look out for to help them recognize trauma my very first reaction is being alive right because we are spiritual beings and so we experience trauma by even coming into this dimension but Mm. uh, to further answer your question a dysregulated central nervous system having anxiety did um, unhealthy habits toxic cycles in our relationships, Mm. Um, people pleasing, not being able to stand up for ourselves, low self-esteem, fear of opening our heart in relationships, speaking our voice, connecting with spirit. All of those are signs of Mm. trauma. And trauma is not, and I, I, I love sharing this message, trauma is not ever what happens to us. It is what happens within us on an emotional Mm. level because the same trauma, a car wreck, or, you know, God forbid, uh, horrible sexual encounter, I'm trying not to use trigger words here, um, could, you know, affect two different people differently. Mm. And a huge trauma like that, is a big deal but then so are the little ones like being a small child at the grocery store and in a moment of excitement our mom asking us or you know us asking for our mom for something and getting a reaction from her because she's under stress about financial right it's the decision within us that we create that depicts the trauma and and on a subconscious level we decide these things these commands and they outpicture in our life um, fear of driving, fear of relationships, money, 
money is hard to get, I'm unworthy of money, I can't speak my voice and say what I desire or else I upset other people. And these are just programs that we create on a subconscious level and that's why doing energy work, doing trauma work clears out those limiting subconscious commands and brings forth the truth of abundance, of our worthiness, of our ability to be safe. Yes. Ah. I'm so on board with you on that. I love, I love that that possibility exists, and not just possibility, but you know, it's like that is the reality of, of life. And I just love that that's like that. Um, you know, um, there's so many different things that we could talk about in the context of manifestation, energy, trauma, etc. But you know, one of my favorite, favorite things to talk about these days uh, in these contexts is to look at, especially when we're thinking about trauma, uh, thinking about it in the context of relationships and like toxic relationships and how, um, you know, um, well, I mean, really, I mean, again, toxic relationships are one of those things that so many of us are struggling with and a lot of times it's laced with trauma experiences and um, and when we try to deal with them you know of course uh, you know it impacts our ability trauma impacts our ability and how we deal with deal with it or not um, so I mean I would love to dig a little bit deeper because I know that's an area of specialization for you Hey, thanks for tuning into this episode. Hope you're getting value out of it. For your information, this episode has been sponsored by the Happiness 101 program. Are you a change maker, coach, trainer, or healer? Are chains of fear holding you back from making the impact and income you desire? Using a unique combination of positive psychology and the spiritual wisdom of our most effective change makers, the Happiness 101 program helps you break through your limiting beliefs and manifest the abundance and success you desire with fun and ease. Interested? Book a free Happiness 101 exploration call with me, your happiness expert, Samia Bano. Just use my online calendar link in the show notes. Now back to the show. It's a great topic to move in because with, you know, me being a manifestation coach, yes, there are so many people around the world that are manifesting money, manifesting wealth. Yeah. The core yeah. thing that we have to understand is that all of life is a relationship, right? Yeah. Uh, and this is how I got started on my journey of mm -hmm. manifesting wealth and abundance and all of those things. I learned along the way that it was never money that I was manifesting. It was yeah. love. It was mm -hmm. it was relationship. And everything that you people are out there manifesting, it all comes down to the relationship with it, even if it's a mm -hmm. healthy body. We have to learn how to have healthy relationships and begin to feel safe in them before we can even manifest anything else. That is so true. Oh my gosh, just the fact that we need to feel safe in our relationship with something in order to like truly manifest and continue to have it in our life. You know, I, I mean so much of my experience has also been about, you know, things come to me, uh, all kinds of amazing gifts and blessings, but because I'm not feeling safe in my relationship with them, I cannot trust, uh, there isn't enough trust in the relationship, those things go away also. <laughs> so, and I mean that, yeah, yeah. Oh. Sorry, I got you off. No, I was just listening. I was just listening. Um, I did want to, you know, just move into sharing 
what I come to understand for myself because I grew up in an extremely um, just polar home. Like my dad loved me so much and so well. And we had a great trauma bond, right? But he was also an avoidant in his in himself. And I don't mean, I'm not putting titles on anything. This is just the best terminology that I can use based on what society has created. Um, I, but he was very abusive. He was narcissist. He would be super loving one day and then mm. extremely abusive the next day. But I held on to the love over the toxicity and I knew that, you know, he would come back around saying he's sorry and, and buying me gifts and, and, and feeling me with the love that I, I thought my heart was worthy of. And I grew into not only becoming that myself, but attracting um, relationships that were just like it. And so my experience um, of, you know, healing from toxic relationships, narcissistic abuse, all of that, I had to come into the understanding of knowing that the reality is, is that all of life is a mirror to us. And mm. once I stopped projecting, I'm uh, attracting toxic relationships because all everything is energy. And we attract, the universal law of attraction is we attract to us a vibrational match of what we vibrate at within mm. our core. And a lot of that is due to trauma. And so when we have unresolved trauma, we vibrate at these lower frequencies, depression, fear, anxiety, and we're like a magnet. We're going to attract people to us yes. that vibrate at that same frequency. And once I started mm. looking at my relationships as a mirror and instead of saying you're you're narcissist i started saying where am i the narcissist oh. where am i you know even if the bottom line was i was narcissistically abusing myself by still choosing to engage in this relationship i took the blame off of other people and I started looking inward. I started looking at my frequency. Where am I being avoided? Where am I being anxious? Mm. Where am I not trusting in myself to be either worthy of better, researching on social media how to uh, be better in this relationship or, you know, uh, and believe for relationships that, that were actually fulfilling and that were going to um, excel me and cause me to thrive. Rejection and abandonment was a core thing that I dealt with. Mm. Yes. Right. Oh, wow. I mean, you have just shared so much over there. Thank you so much, first of all, for sharing something of your own experiences. Um, and, well, I mean, to have grown up in that kind of very polarized, um, kind of context in your relationship with your dad especially um, and then to come to realize to have this realization of you know that your relationships are a mirror well wow. you know I mean uh, you know when when you talk about um, our relationships are a mirror and you attract um, really, uh, people in our lives that are a vibrational match. Um, I, I actually agree with you on that. I'm 100% on board. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe um, there's just one um, sort of um, not even clarification that's coming to my mind to share, but just this idea that, you know, we like even if we have narcissistic tendencies or abusive tendencies, uh, not everyone will um, manifest. Not manifest. Like in when you look, when you see different people, how they act, how they behave, these tendencies can emerge in in personalities that appear very different from each other. 
you know i mean so one person can be very angry screaming shouting and i think people recognize that kind of behavior and personality as oh abuse narcissism in fact are much more easily than someone who's uh who does it in a more quiet kind of way and um um uh, yeah that just looks very different um in in and so i i think that's also part of like if you're going to come to the realization about oh like the mirror aspect of things i can i guess that can be a little bit tricky um <clears throat> okay um so mirror i don't necessarily mean direct reflection right so if you have someone mm -hmm. who's gentle with their words and they're being screamed and yelled at and and all these these things but rather a mirror to ourselves of our ability to either love well or be loved well mm -hmm. and so uh, one of the greatest revelations i have because they say that narcissists can never self-reflect so I would not say that I was narcissist, right? Because I would not have been able to have this spiritual awakening and recover my life to the depth that I have. But I was definitely very emotionally abusive and avoidant mm. um, and at, at one time. And um, when I began doing my personal work, and I have, right, like I still do life with my dad. I still do life with people who are quote-unquote narcissists. When I started viewing them as myself and saying, stop pointing the finger and putting names and titles on them and viewed them as hurt people. Just yeah. hurt people mm. who have a need that they are not able to express. And bypassing myself and mm. how I was feeling, right, at removing the need to be, make them wrong or the, the need to feel rejected and 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 just look at them as like how can i love them right mm. my relationship dynamics with all of these people and within myself changed drastically yeah oh. i learned to i learned to take the time and allow consciousness god spirit whatever you choose to call them to say, what is this person trying to communicate with me that they need right now? Yes. You know, this says, I must say, uh, been, uh, um, wow, okay, so when you are interacting with somebody and their behavior is difficult to deal with, uh, but, you know, the very fact that we are using this language, whether it's um, in our thinking, or in our expression to them that oh your behavior is abusive or your behavior is difficult or your behavior is narcissist i mean right there there's a judgment and the moment we have this judgment like i know for me um i've gotten a lot lot better at this now but i can still struggle with it the moment i have this judgment it just um takes me into a different place and a different like feeling and um, you know my defense mechanisms want to shoot right up because immediately then I'm like going into self-protection mode and uh, down the drain goes compassion down the <laughs> drain goes empathy and then you know it's just like oh no now I'm in defense mode, you know, and um, so for me, a lot of time that means um, I need to um, be like, I don't want to deal with you anymore. I'm not going to deal with you anymore and walk away. And um, or, uh, you know, I mean, because I'm not, I used to be really into like fighting, <laughs> but not anymore. I don't, I don't want to. So now I just walk away. <laughs> but. Um, you know, but yeah, the the way that I've gotten better, as I was uh, referring to, is that there are times and there are people when I'm able to not get into that judgmental mindset, 
and instead focus, like you were saying, Sarah, on the fact that I'm dealing with a hurt person who's trying to express some need underlying their behavior and to be able to figure out what that need is and focus on uh, um, on meeting that need, on uh, being like, okay, how can we meet this need? Is there anything I can do in this moment to help meet this need? And when I can do that, and you are absolutely right, I mean, it uh, it's a, such a different experience. It's such a different feeling. I mean, and, and it absolutely changes the relationship as well. Um, but and like I said, it, it's still like for me, it can uh, it can be challenging to to allow that to happen. And so it's like, uh, and for a lot of people, I know that um, uh, they may not be able. I mean, they may struggle with it even more than I'm struggling with it. So how do you even, like, I mean, wow, if, if you're still someone, if I'm still someone who is struggling with this ability to let go of their judgment and just focus on this person's heart and they're trying to express a need and, and you know, just stay with that focus, um, how do I even begin to let go of my judgment and shift my focus. It would come back to us understanding the truth of who we are mm -hmm. as um, just love, right? Like I am spirit, love, mm -hmm. having a human experience. So my purpose is to understand as well as being understood. I'm not I'm not saying tolerate any type of abuse, right? But we can even lovingly put up boundaries towards that gently and say, I I need to take a step back, right? Mm -hmm. But in when it comes to non judgment when being encountered with someone who's being defiant, I guess is it a good word for it, it is changing the vibration and the intention within yourself, right? It may not happen immediately, but saying, okay, I choose to learn how to love and do relationship with this person. So I'm going to choose mm -hmm. to pretty much go into their subconscious mind as a child and understand that they are still reacting to a core wound that they had as a child. Um, uh, uh, a great topic that I love talking about is what they call an avoidant, fearful avoidant and dismissive avoidant. These are the people that are so quick to be like, come here, I love you. And then the second mm -hmm. that they feel emotionally afraid, they're like, F you, get away from me. They're the ones breaking things. They're the ones who will just block you out of nowhere and, and mm -hmm. just cut you down with their words. And it's a, it's a matter of moving into non-judgment slowly over time, making the decision, is this someone I am supposed to have a relationship, first of all, with? That's the first question. And if they are, then being intentional about not judging them, right? But and I don't want to say judging yourself, but that that projection of judgment that we feel that we should have, taking it inwardly and putting it towards ourselves over time will cause in an, an energetic shift to where we can say, you know what, I want to create a safe place for myself and this person to have emotional freedom. Mm. And when we do it within the subconscious mind, like within our heart, that shifts things all in its own and in itself. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, to move into non-judgment, we have to go inwardly, learn how to not judge ourselves first, mm -hmm. and set a powerful intention, hey, I want to figure this out. Yes. 
Yes, and also what you said about uh, do we even want to be in that relationship? Is this the relationship that we want to have, need to have in our lives? Yes. You just made me think about, um, I mean, not to name names, um, but, uh, you know, I have, like, uh, some relationships in my life uh, that, I, I mean, literally, like, I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse, and the person that he's, he sexually abused me, I just, uh, I was like, I don't need this person, and I don't want this person in my life. And so he's out. He's out. Um, and, um, um, that's that. But there's, like, other people in my life where these, uh, I mean, the, the, the nature of, I mean, again, it's like putting labels and the labels themselves are problematic, but for the sake of communication if I use a label so people can understand the problem or the sense of problem that I struggle with um, you know the nature of abuse is like mental emotional and the, the thing about this um, mental emotional abuse is that it is um, like so like when you look at it in the context of um, people's everyday experiences, not just my own, you see that this kind of behavior is just so normal, by which I mean not that it's okay, not that it's uh, healthy, no, but it's so common, it's so common, um, people are experiencing it in their homes, in their workplaces, um, between friends, and I'm one of the very few people in my uh, circle of family and friends who is even identifying that this behavior is abusive because I've had a certain education, you know, where I went and I studied about abuse and trauma and this and that. And so I'm one of the few people who's even identifying that, hey, this fits in the category of behavior that is abusive. And, um, and, and you know, like I was sharing earlier, the moment I, I judge a behavior to be abusive, it brings up all of these. And especially in a close relationship, um, you know, that's a friend, supposed to be friend or family member. And um, I don't want to break off every single one of these relationships, you know. And so uh, there are some of them that I'm like, no, I, I, I value this relationship. I want to continue with this relationship. And we're having this challenge in this relationship. <laughs> But, you know, these are very, I, I've selected a very few relationships of this kind that I'm willing to work on. Uh, I mean, for a lot of, like, when I experience, um, a lot of times I'm just like, no, I just, uh, like, if this relationship's not foundational, if it's not particularly necessary in my life, I just, I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to not deal with you. Really, really, really good question. Um, just going to tune in. Okay, so in my experience of dealing with, right, when I took the, those judgments of them away and I started engaging them as emotionally immature versus emotionally mature, right? Mm. And I could ask myself, why am I taking this so personally? Why am I being yeah. triggered, right? And when I went internally and I made the decision to not allow this person's behavior to be identified to me as abusive, uh -huh. right? 
because then that takes me from being the victim. I'm no longer the victim. Now, I, I just want to be clear, there's a borderline here, right? There are abusive <laughs> relationships that we need to cut out on end. I am not saying anyone ever tolerate, you know, an abusive relationship. But when it's, you know, low grade or, or whatever you want to call, and we, we do that, that decision within to shift, I'm telling you, the energy of that relationship mm -hmm. will shift. And yeah. something that bit me so hard, I, I'm, I'm a transformational coach, okay? And so I've, I've had a lot of deep training around relationships. Um, I was in a traumatic divorce. I've, I've gone through parent alienation and all kinds of things with my kid's father. And one of the hardest things that I had to accept and admit, right? Like I didn't deserve that. I had done my time. I'm in recovery. I had gotten sober like five years into my recovery. I shouldn't still be being alienated and emotionally abused and victimized by my kid's father. But at the same time, I had to look inwardly and look at my ego and say, Sarah, where are you still holding judgment? Where are you still having this frequency within myself? And so my coach taught me that we have what's called listening ears, right? And they're the ears that other people listen to us through. And I had to say, what are his listening ears? What does he think about me within his ears whenever I go to speak? Where have I been myself abusive where have I been not fully shown up in this relationship and also mm. be courageous enough to have a conversation with that person and be like mm. this is what I've made you out to be right and this is a hard one especially yeah. in deep abusive relationships but after you know the air clears and even if it hasn't just it's it's all about a heart to heart connection and being really raw and really vulnerable. Mm. Saying, you know what? I make you out to be emotionally abusive. And and when we tell that person this stuff, it opens the door for them to be like, "Well, I make you out to be um uh, unreceptive of my feelings or or difficult to communicate with, right? Like there is yeah. a mirror mirror going on all the time and when when we just choose love no matter what that looks like it shifts relationships to the core yeah you know okay you know when you uh hmm, you know what this just brought up for me so this is going back to the time when i was uh training as a crisis counselor to work on a domestic violence and sexual assault hotline. And I actually uh, was uh, on the hotline working as a crisis counselor for four years. And one of the things that they trained us um, on was this, I uh, well, you know, so they were like, we do not recommend couples counseling for people who are in abusive relationships. I mean, and we are now talking about domestic violence context more specifically because, you know, that's what the uh, focus was in the context of, you know, it was a, a crisis line for domestic violence. And so they said, we don't recommend couples counseling uh, for uh, uh, mostly we were dealing with women coming to us as clients. And so uh, because they said, um, you know, it's in the nature of, you know, abusive relationships where you're stuck in a circle of violence, that the person who's engaging in the abusive behavior, they're on and they have an agenda to exercise power and control over you. And unless they are willing to let go of that agenda, counseling cannot help. Because in order for you to go into therapy and have counseling as a couple, uh, you know, you have to be willing to uh, change. You have to be willing to do things 
for each other that are different from how you're doing things now. And you absolutely cannot have the agenda of trying to control the other person. And so when one person has that agenda, counseling, therapy, um, couples counseling cannot work. And in fact, in many situations, it's been found that when, um, for example, cases, um, for one reason or other, the couple is forced to go that route uh, to meet various requirements, uh, for example, when cases go to court or something, actually, you know, the abusive partner can actually pretend to go through the motions, but then when they get back home, they take out their anger and frustration even more on, on, the, on the partner, on the other partner. And so they were like, we just don't, you don't recommend this. And I took that lesson uh, from the training, and I, I think I may have overgeneralized the um, the lesson in terms of how I started to live my life, where I was like, you know, um, like when I started noticing people in my life who had, in my opinion or judgment, abusive tendencies or abusive behaviors, like a lot of times I'd be like, this person's trying to control me and they're on the, they had this agenda to control me, so talking to them is useless. <laughs> uh, so when you just shared about, you know, like talk to them, you know, I was like realizing, oh, maybe that's, I mean, I've tried to walk on and think differently about this, but that may be part of still what I'm carrying that makes it difficult for me to talk to people that I judge <laughs> as having abusive behavior. And, and I, I do want to be clear, like I am talking, you know, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about severe name calling. I'm not talking about physical abuse. I'm not talking about you know, slamming doors and throwing things. Like, that is a, a, a hard no. Um, unless, you know, it's, so there's, there's like the outer court relationships and the mm -hmm. inner court relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And we have to learn to scale the difference of how to behave and respond to the ones who are closest to us, family members, do you know what I'm saying? And then yeah. the the outer court relationships, our employers, the ones who work at our job, um, people we see just on the weekends and, and different things like that. Um, uh, but when we have the decision from, you know, it's, it's not, it is still easy to, to change the, the dynamic of a relationship that has been had and been this way for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's even easier in new relationships from the beginning mm -hmm. just without any without being like you're not going to control me just not being controllable when yes. you stand that ground and you are not controllable and you gently and lovingly put up your boundaries um like one of the things that i love teaching about is the 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 energy between a feminine and a masculine in a romantic mm. relationship. Mm. So I teach my clients um, to put up feminine boundaries towards the masculine that are not projecting her to be an unsafe woman. So for an example, I have a client whose husband was um, speaking to her in a way that she didn't like, right? And I, instead of being like, you're not going to talk to me like that, right? And, and standing up for herself in that way with her voice very boldly and powerfully, I suggested her, instead of putting up that boundary towards him, she put up that boundary to herself silently. I'm not going to allow him to speak to me this way. Mm -hmm. And said very lovingly and gently, hey, I'm going to so-and-so's house for the weekend or um, I need some space or right so the boundary mm -hmm. that we're putting up isn't towards other people as if I have to put this up to keep you away it's within yeah. 
putting this boundary up within myself so that I am in my power, so that I am safe, and so that mm. I can hold true to who I am. And when we do that without an outwardly projection, that will also shift the dynamic of the relationship. Yes. Ah, I really love what you were just sharing. Yes, so, so the one thing, it's one thing to put up a boundary, but also like how are you putting up the boundary? What kind of boundaries are you putting up? That is such an important consideration. And you know what you just shared, said about um, I'm not going to be controllable? Wow, well, that just made a lot of, lot of sense and just made me think about um, actually some of my heroes who like um, in terms of like people who live nonviolence in in their lives and you know for me the, the people who, are, who live nonviolence um, you know they're they are I mean a lot of people don't like the word nonviolence it's like compassion is the the the, the the other side of the coin, right? They have like such amazing levels of, of compassion that they live with. And um, uh, so many, you know, stories that I know about, for example, you know, like Jesus, Prophet Muhammad, um, uh, you know, I mean, the um, currently living people like Dalai Lama, you know, who who live with such amazing compassion. And it, it, I bet that's a lot of what's happening with them is that, you know, like people hurl abusive behavior towards them or act in abusive ways towards them, but they don't receive it as such because they're like, I'm not control, controllable. You can try to control me, but you don't, that's not whether I get controlled or not. That's my choice. Yeah, so you know? now, now we're getting into a conversation that I love, which is more along the spiritual awakening um, yeah. side. But when we are able to embody the Christ mm. consciousness, embody mm. the Muhammad consciousness, embody, yeah. you know, Buddha consciousness, whatever you want yeah. to call it, we begin to learn that our life is predestined and everything is happening for a reason on time so that we can one and only goal embody that love and when we become safe to know like Jesus knew his mission right mm. if he didn't have connection with God he would have what ran away hid somewhere like he wouldn't have made it all the way to the cross but he knew he was enduring that for a purpose right when we're that in tune with ourselves, then which that's a totally different like because he was severely abused right but it it's a it's 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 a it's an inner knowing of our worthiness and our ability to know which it's all that that story is metaphysical it's it's a, it's a story it's a story of of us right it's a biography mm -hmm. of us and so it's a demonstration of what we are like when we encounter these these persecutions or these mm -hmm. these you know and and the moral of the story is when we choose compassion and we choose forgiveness it awakens the, the, the resurrected mm. life force energy of us and we become even invincible eternal beings who, you know, leave our legacy and, and all of the things. And so okay. it's it's the core thing to know is I am love. I am a spiritual being having a human experience mm. and that is all that I am. And when we yeah. hold that in our consciousness, we get to show up different in our relationships. We get to say no to different things. We get to love from a place of, of knowing who we are. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yes. 
So how do we cultivate more of that knowing of our truth, our spiritual truth and reality of, you know, being spiritual beings, having a human experience, being here to learn, love, to, to love and be loved and to really, ah, to, um, you know, become better and better at it. By doing our trauma work, by doing our shadow yes. work. We have to clear out the soul. We have to mm. clear out the energy. Emotions are, in, everything is energy, so emotions are yeah. energy. And, and our body stores those emotions from past experiences. Mm. And I'm someone who teaches about not past lives in the sense of, oh, I, I don't get into the whole, did we really have a past life thing? I'm talking about lineage, right? Mm. On an epigenetics level, we are still connected and carrying the emotions of our ancestors. Mm. And when we take the conscious decision, I'm going to do my trauma work. I'm going to clear out my soul to clear out all the lineage trauma and to become a vibrational container of the frequency of love, that is how. That is the only yeah. way. <laughs> yes. And you know, oh gosh. And in this context, like the energy work can be so helpful, make things so much more fun and easy. Like, um, Oh my gosh, you know, I would, before I got um, introduced to energy work, I had spent many years actually trying to train my brain and uh, rewire my, my mind um, to think differently and thereby feel differently. And, and it's just, you know, slow work. It feels like a lot of hard work sometimes. Um, but beyond that, you know, it's just, it, it cannot go deep enough. It, it cannot because when you are, I mean, obviously our heart, mind, soul, everything's at one level interconnected and interdependent. But, um, I mean, at least in the context of like, for example, uh, modern uh, theories of cognitive behavior therapy, etc. They just don't even recognize, you know, the spiritual side of us and all of that. And so, even the solutions that they do come up with in terms of how you can retrain your brain, etc., it all just stays pretty surface level. And so, it wasn't until I got exposed to energy work and energy healing that I started to be able to, you know, hit those deeper aspects of myself and begin to feel those becoming uh, more awakened. And, and, and then I was like, ah, ah, I'm feeling, feeling these, I'm having these experiences of healing that I cannot even explain through my, through my mind. Yes. You know, <sighs> energy work is is phenomenal, and it does so much in our our life. Um, ha however, and I just want to add this: we have the subconscious mind or the the soul, mm -hmm. which is ninety seven percent of our operating system, and it's yeah. like a an iceberg. Right? We have this huge hidden belief system underneath the surface. And only yes. 3% is, is in control of our reality. And when we do the deeper subconscious reprogramming work mm. and we change that story that is being held under the surface, so many things, so many things. I used to be in abusive relationships on food stamps, low income. Um, just that the housing, like, and when I found out about this work, I made a decision. I realized, oh my gosh, my subconscious program is poverty and lack, and I'm unworthy of love. Um, I'm, I'm a drug addict, whatever the thing. Um, but I then have in four years now, right? Like I have created 
a six-figure business. I am in healthy relationships that, that thrive and light me up. I am not on any low-income um, resources. I'm not making them wrong. just want to be clear, right? I am powerfully knowing who I am and living my soul's purpose and calling. And it's all because of energy work and doing that deeper trauma work. And that's yeah. why I built the Heart Revival, which yeah. is a 12-week trauma recovery program to help women heal from their limited story. Ah, I love it. I love it. Ah, yes. Yes. Is there anything more you want to share about this uh, program or, or anything else? Because I feel like, you know, we could keep talking for a long, long time. <laughs> and I mean, maybe uh, if if there's something more you want to share about this wonderful program that you have, and then you can uh, wrap up for today. Uh, it is for women on the spiritual awakening journey who want to revive their heart. I have three levels. Um, one is just the spiritual savage, twelve week inner healing and trauma recovery, and then the second level is done with you. Um, business, launching and growing your own spiritual oh. offer uh, for, because in the first level, 12 weeks, we awaken and birth our soul's purpose. And mm. then I, for the second level, I help women um, really birth their sacred offer and create their sacred offer. And I teach them how to do organic marketing and energetic marketing and all of that. And then the third level is actually a practitioner program where I teach and train how to do the heart revival framework and um, train them to be trauma coaches. And so. Oh, that's so wonderful. I love it. You know, that's how I got into doing the work that I do as a happiness expert. I actually connected with my very first um, happiness expert mentor uh, coach. And uh, she had a 12-week um, program. She calls it the Happiness Makeover. And uh, it's like first you have to go through it as a student for yourself, you know. And uh, once uh, you go through that program, then you have the opportunity to, f to, to learn from her how you may want to, um, you know, create your own work along those lines and then you know also train I actually ended up um, at that time she didn't have a specific program to teach you the business side of things but I ended up interning with her so so that I could learn from her when I felt ready like I had okay here I wanted what I got clear about what I wanted to teach and had a sense of okay this is what I want to offer to the world and so forth. Then I stepped into the internship with her so I could learn more of the business side of how she set up her practice and managed it and all of that good stuff. So these kind of programs can be so life-changing and it's a wonderful um, pathway to follow. And sometimes, you know, you, you enter into the first level of the program not even not having even any thought to go to the next level or the next level but you know it's just know that for a lot of like it, it it happens a lot more often than you might imagine that once you go through the first level it's like then you find yourself in such a different place that it makes sense to then be like oh yes second level and yes third level let's go let's do it <laughs> yes and that's exactly how it was for me. Um, I started, I just had, I was desperate need of healing my life. I had come across Lewis Hayes' book, How to Heal Your Life, and I knew that this reality was possible. And then I just started manifesting, you know, the different coaches into my life to follow. And one of them had a, a healing program. And, and then in that, I was like, I think I'm supposed to do this work, right? And then the next level was building my business. And then the next level yeah. was being trained as a trauma practitioner and so here I am and I have created um, you know my own framework and offer to help other women who are on this same journey oh, I love it I love it yes oh gosh 
Ah, oh, that's so wonderful, Sarah. Oh gosh. Okay, so I will I will uh, force myself to stop talking uh, just in context of uh, you know this interview right now. Um, and for my last reminder, I will send our audience remind our audience to please make sure you check the show notes because I will be dropping Sarah's links in there so you can connect with her, continue to learn with her and get the help and support you need whenever you're ready for it. And until we connect next time, I wish you lots and lots of peace and joy. <laughs>